Good morning. Good morning. I was glad when they said that we could go to the house of the Lord. And I was thinking this week about some of the things that I'm thankful for, Lane Prairie. Number one, I'm so thankful that we go to a church where they preach and teach the Bible. I'm thankful that Lane Prairie is a praying church, and I'm thankful for our worship service on Sunday mornings. I love the singing. I love the preaching. Uh, I'm thankful to be here, and so to begin our worship service, um, we will read scripture. If you're willing and able to stand with me, we're reading from Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, this morning, we are just thankful for you. We're thankful that you sent your son so that we might have reconciliation to you. This morning, I just want to pray for our pastors. We have several who are on our mission trip. We have one who is going to be leading the service in a different church this morning. I just lift him up. I lift up that service. I pray for our pastor as he brings the word to us this morning. I pray for that entire mission team in Brownsville this morning. Pray for them this week for health, for safety. Pray for the hearts and the ears and the minds for people to as they hear the gospel. I just pray and lift up this church service to you. In Jesus' name, amen. the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory, yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today.
If you have a copy of scripture this morning, I'd ask you to join me in uh, Psalm chapter 27, Psalm 27. So if you'll join me there, um, we're going to spend our time this morning. You know, I, I, I don't know if you've ever had times in your life where you felt like everything and everyone was against you. <laughs> have you been there before? Um, whether that's family, work, just life in general. Well, Psalm 27 finds David at one of those times. Uh, we don't know particularly what time it is. There's not a particular event that we can uh, draw out of the text or is there in the superscription to give us an indication of what's going on. But the, the indication is that this is probably, and many believe, a, a royal psalm, the time at which he is actually king who's taken the throne and there are enemies around him. And they're not just seeking to belittle him, even though they are, we're going to see they're, they're lying about him. They're seeking after his life. They're seeking to put him to death. And so Psalm 27, I, I, I don't know how many times I've shared this psalm. If, if uh, 
I, I were probably to have people raise their hands this morning, and at least as I've visited, if you've been in the hospital and I've been there with you, I've probably shared Psalm 27.5 with you. Um, many people, I think about a time that this psalm I, I use so often as I'm in the midst of ministry and people are hurting and people uh, don't know what to do in that time of crisis, and I go to Psalm 27 a lot. I remember a time several years ago before the Lord took Jimmy Fox home, and uh, Jimmy and Shirley were up at the Texas Health ER there, and it wasn't looking good with her blood sugar stuff, and I remember coming in, and we began to pray. I shared this, and uh, every so often, Shirley, she'll be like, Psalm 27. Uh, She'll just say that to me. And so the word of God ministers. So when we find ourselves in those times, the appropriate response for us is to go to the word of God. And so we're going to see what we see within this text today. It's interesting how it lays out in, in this poetry. It's beautiful poetry, the psalm, that the, the way this lies out. And so a word that unless you're in seminary, uh, you'll know it, and otherwise you'll forget it as soon as I say it, probably. Uh, and I've said this word to you before, and you'll, you forgot it before, but that's okay. Um, but the structure of it is just beautiful, the way it li- lays out. It's called a chiasm. And so it's basically saying there are parts from the beginning to the end that parallel one another. And there's kind of two things and two ideas. And so there's this parallel of confidence that bookend the psalm, and there's these two sections that parallel each other with the idea of seeking in the middle. And so I want us to look this morning at this text and and what we're going to see as we walk away from this, I'm going to give you that that big one sentence takeaway that we're going to then draw out of the text this morning is this, is when we find ourselves in those desperate situations that those who seek God's presence and direction will find confidence in him. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's look at the text. I want to do something. I'm going to read the entire text together, and then we'll go back and kind of take it apart together. But this is what the word of the Lord says. Psalm 27 says this, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though the war rise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry my voice, and be gracious to me, and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me, nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desires of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. So this morning, I I love this psalm. I I pray that you would mark it, and when you find those places, you would go, this psalm gets put on repeat. In my life, and as I minister to people as they face difficult times, in fact, a a member of our church is going through a particularly difficult time right now in a family situation, ran into him this last week at Home Depot, um, and I quoted parts of this psalm to him. Um, in a situation that's beyond them, I remind them as we sang that the battle belongs to the Lord, that our confidence is in God. I'm I'm dealing and ministering to different people that this psalm has been a part of that ministry because it finds us at that most desperate point of our lives. 
And so as we look at this, we see these bookends of confidence in God. We see this first, these first three verses, we see these declarations of confidence in God. Look at these verses again. Look at, look at what he says in the first verse here. This is the declaration, even though, as we see within the text, that enemies are encamped around. They're lying about David. They're seeking to take his life. They're there for him. And yet the declaration of confidence is this, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? You know, for us, many times we took, and we looked at this previously, and over the last couple of weeks, we boast in all the earthly things that we think give us strength and power and position. But yet the psalmist here, even though this is David writing, the king over the nation of Israel at this time. Even though he is there, he's that, that man, and he's seen God in all this, he, his boast is not in armies, it's not in cities, it's not in fortified walls. His boast is in the Lord. He is the light. He is my salvation. He is the one. Any deliverance that I have experienced or I will experience is because of God. God can use all those things, but it is God ultimately who is light and salvation. He is the one who brings the deliverance. The Lord is the defense of my life. David, look at what he's saying. He says, hey, I don't have to defend my life because God is the one who defends my life. And so if he chooses to take me out, he chooses to do. If he chooses to sustain me, he does. But God is the one who defends my life. And so what it is, is is there's this declaration of confidence in the Lord that says, Lord, this is you, this is not me. We like to go the other way with it and said, hey, I will do this. I will defend myself. They start lying about me, and so I'm going to turn around and I'm going to start speaking about them. Hey, they've come after me. Well, you know what? I read somewhere an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and so I'm going to exact that revenge. And we forget what the word of the Lord says, that revenge belongs to the Lord. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. And so there's this strong confidence. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Think about the imagery of this. There's likely a time that they're encamped around and he could go to the wall and look out and you would go out at night and you could see the lights around the camps as the enemy is encamped there and you can see them. He says, you know what? The Lord is my light and my salvation. I, I see the enemy. They're, they're before me, but I know who my God is. This declaration of confidence. When evildoers come upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. The war rise up against me. In spite of this, I shall be confident. So so the question becomes, we see this strong declaration of confidence that David has, even though he's he's outlined the, the scenario, he's painted the picture for us. They're there. War has risen up against me. The host, the enemy encamp about me. The evildoers have come upon, they're devouring my life. They're seeking my life. How does he get to this point to say, in spite of all that, in spite of all that I see that's against me, I'm confident? Because that's not our natural. In our flesh, our, our, our natural is to run away, right? Or our, it's fight or flight, right? It's we're either going to raise up and take it on and we're going to go after it or I'm going to get out of here. But yet, as David is there and he looks and sees it, he says, I'm confident. How? And I think what we see within this psalm, these two parallel sections that deal with this idea of seeking. This is how we get to, and I think that's the beauty of the poetry of this, of it being bookended in confidence on both ends, is we see how do we get to that point, and it comes through seeking. And first it comes through, I believe, in verse 4 through 6, seeking the presence of God. Look at what verse 4 through 6 say again. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek. 
And notice what happens here. He, he goes and he's, he lays out all these different places. He talks about, look at it, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and meditate in his temple. Uh, for in the day of his, uh, trouble, he will conceal me in the tabernacle. And then it talks about in the secret place of his tent. Um, and, and we see all these words that are different places that represent different places where God met with his people. All right. When it says temple, it's probably referring to the tabernacle. This is probably not in the time where Solomon's uh, temple had been built yet. Um, and so they had the tabernacle. You see in 2 Samuel chapter 6, you see that uh, David actually had a tent where the Ark of the Covenant was placed in, and that was the place. And so you remember, you remember all the way back to Moses, they had the tent of their, the tabernacle, and they, had, they would make these booths. And all these imageries come to mind and say, as through Israel's history, there's been these places that God has had them set up where his presence would reside. And so what does David say? In the midst of the enemy encamped around me, seeking to devour my flesh, I'm going to seek the presence of God. And he uses all those different words. It's one thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. He wants to go to the place where God's presence is residing. And, and we understand, and I believe David understood as well. I, I believe they would have understood back then that God, obviously God's presence is all places. We have Psalm 139 that talks about that. Where can I go to escape your presence? I make my bed. I go here. I go there. I go to the depths. I, die. I can't escape God's prayer. They would have understood that. But David is talking specifically about the place where the body of believers gathered to worship God. He says, I want to go to that place when everything else around me seems like it's up against me. I want to go to the place where I know God is at. The place where worship of God takes place. He talks about that later in the deal, talking about singing. Notice, he, he, he has this seeking of God's presence. He says that I shall seek, and then look down in the end of verse 4, and, and it says, what, what is he going to do in that place when he's seeking, when he goes to the temple, when he goes to the tent, when he goes to the house of the Lord? What is he going to do? What does he want to do when he goes there? He says he wants to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. And so what he's saying is this, I am seeking the presence of God. I want to go and behold the beauty of the Lord. I want to be in his presence. And so you, you know what we do. You know what we've done is we've gathered together to get today in this place. We have, guess what? We have beheld the beauty of the Lord, have we not? As we sang songs remembering who God is and remembering what God's done, remembering Jesus and how he sacrificed for us. We sang about what God has done and who God is. We've beheld the beauty of who God is this morning. As we've worshiped, we've read his word. You've studied his word in Bible study this morning. You've beheld the beauty of God. You've come into his presence. And to meditate in his temple. We're taking time to ponder and think about and, and take to heart. It wasn't just an intellectual, mental pursuit that we showed up and we went to Bible study. It's not an intellectual uh, uh, pursuit right now as we look into the Word of God to say, check, I did that. What, if that was it, I would read this to you and say, all right, have a good day. Go on your way. We're spending time looking at it, meditating. What does this mean? How do I apply this to my life? Lord, how are you going to use this in my life? And as we have that fellowship with God, it's in his presence. And so how does David get to that point of confidence? I believe the first thing we see here is that he is seeking the presence of God. He isn't first running to seek the counsel of advisors. He's running to seek the face of God. Many times when we face things that come against us, our first action or reaction is to run and seek the counsel of other people instead of seek the Lord first. Have you been guilty of that? I know I have. God, this situation, these people are doing this, they're saying this, this has come up against me, and so I'm going to go and I'm going to rally the troops of earthly people to myself. 
so that then I can take up arms and I can rise up against it instead of saying, you know what? The battle belongs to the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? I'm going to have confidence in the Lord and I'm going to seek his face and his presence first. There's nothing wrong with seeking godly counsel. Don't don't hear me wrong and say, well, Ricky, you told me I should never. That's not what I said. (laughs) The first place we go to is to seek the Lord, to seek his face, to seek his presence. And then when we do seek counsel, we better make sure that it lines up with the word of God. Because there's lots of well-meaning believers out there that will give you counsel, but it might not be accurate to the Word of God. But this confidence, I believe, comes through seeking the presence of the Lord. For in the day of trouble, look at this picture of closeness and presence in verse 5. This is why I share verse 5 so much with people that are hurting, that are desperate, that they don't know what to do in that moment. It says, so in the middle of that chaos, of that moment, of whatever's going on and falling apart around you, in that day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. He, He will protect me. He he will hide me from those who seek to harm me. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. He will put me on a place of sure foundation. And so sometimes in the midst of what we think our world is falling apart, we think that God is far away and God does not know what's going on. So that's why many times we run to outside counsel instead of the presence of God. But right here we see, you know what? In that day, God draws us to himself when we seek him. And now, look at this. The confidence continues to come through as he's seeking the Lord. And it says, now, as I've pursued the presence of God, as I seek the presence of God, now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, and yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Is somebody that's confident, are they spending time praising and worshiping God if they're focused on the enemy outside the camp? No. But his confidence in seeking the presence of God moves him to a place of worship. And he says, my head will be lifted up. You know, in military battle, the strategic place is the high place or the low place. It's the high place. So what does he say? When I've sought the presence of God, my head will be lifted up above my enemies that are around about me. He has the strategic place of power. And it's not because anything he did, it's because of who God is. So how do we get that confidence? By seeking the presence of the Lord. And then there's this second parallel seeking that takes place in verses 7 through 12. And I believe it gives us a a, a picture of seeking God's direction. And, And you'll notice also in these verses, you know, everything has seemed like you get the sense of confidence in those six verses, right? You, you like you hear it, like you read it and you look at it, you hear it, and you go, that is a person who is confident. And when you read verses seven through 12, you go, that is a person who is not confident. But when you really look at it, confidence still comes through. I think many times, and I think what we see within the text here is, and we see it, I believe, from the, the verse 13 as well, when he says he would have despaired if he didn't believe he'd see the goodness of God in the land of the living. He, he had not seen the deliverance and salvation of God yet. This is something, obviously, that had been going on when the time of writing this. And so, you know, what happens oftentimes is when we say, you know what, that situation arises and that we're confronted with it and we do a good job and we seek the presence of God and we're doing good and we're confident. But when God doesn't answer immediately, sometimes we begin to waver. And I think I, you see a little bit of that come through. I think the confidence of David is still there. But as we wait for God, man, it is, it is tough to wait for the Lord, is it not? Especially as we see here that they're seeking to devour his flesh, that they're continuing to lie about him. And on and on and on. But notice it says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. 
be gracious to me and answer me. Does this sound like someone who's in the presence of God, who's confident of the presence? It sounds like there's a little bit of wavering, but what we're gonna see as he continues to seek God's presence and seek God's direction, I believe you see the confidence come roaring back in. Be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O oh Lord, I shall seek. He said, I've, I've sought your presence. You told me to seek your presence and I've, I've done that. The enemies are still camped around. God, verse nine, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me nor forsake me. Oh, God of my salvation. We hear the, pre, the plea of a desperate person right here. Desperate for the presence of God, desperate for the direction of God. Look, look what happens as it, as it moves on and continues on. This is where he's at, where he's feeling right now. I don't believe this is a literal thing that took place. I believe he's using this to drive home the point for my father and my mother have forsaken me. You ever been there where you feel like every other person, even the person that you would consider the closest to you in this world, it feels like you've been abandoned by them. Even when you feel like every other person has abandoned you, you are not abandoned. Because look at what he says. Even though everybody else, it feels like maybe they actually did. Maybe it just feels like it because of circumstance. Everyone else has abandoned me. But look at the end of verse 10. But the Lord will take me up. And we see this desperation, but yet the confidence keeps coming through, pursuing the presence. He said, I, you told me to seek your face, and I've, I've sought your face. I've sought your presence, Lord. And then verse 11, this is, I believe, him seeking God's direction. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path, a, a straight path, a, a path that's not going to trip me up, the path that you have because of my foes. Look at the contrast that comes here. Do not deliver me over to the desires of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen up against me, and such as breathe out violence. We see a contrast here of God's way. He says, lead me in your way, in your path. God, I want to go about this the right way, in your way. I don't want to follow the way of the world. I want to walk in righteousness. I don't want to walk in unrighteousness and sin. So God, lead me in the direction you have. Lead me in your way. Teach me your way. What does your commandment say? What does your word say about how I go through this situation right now? How do I act when people lie about me? How do I act when people come against me? God, what is it that you want me to do? Not what my flesh wants me to do. God, what is it that your word tells me I should do in this time? And so we see that contrast. He's seeking God. So God, teach me your way. You know, as we seek God's presence, we also need to seek God's direction. But I believe it's going to be very difficult for us to discern God's direction if we're not seeking God's presence. If we're not walking, that, that picture of presence is that idea of fellowship, of relationship. And as we walk with the Lord and we walk in the Spirit, we're sensitive to the Spirit, and the Spirit can prompt us towards God's Word or says, here's the direction that you need to take in this situation. And God will lead us. Do you believe that God will lead you? This confidence is, is surging back. He's saying, God, teach me your way. Lead me in the level path. I want to go the right way that you have for me to go, not the way the rest of the world is going, the way that you would have for me to go. Do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen up against me. They breathe out violence. David is saying, that's not the way that I want to go. God, that's, that's not your way. That's their way. That's the world's way. And so we see here this confidence. How does he get there? He's seeking the presence of God. He's seeking the direction of God. And we don't know the timeline. When was it? How long was this? Did David understand? Help me think back through the life of David. 
David learned to wait on the Lord, didn't he? <laughs> we've been, we've just finished up at the end of this last semester, we're going through on Wednesday nights, the book of 1 Samuel. We did it over the course of about a year and a half. And as we've done that and we've sought that, we've seen David in a majority of the book, in a majority of the book, anointed as king, but not in the position of king. Because Saul still occupied it. And Saul chased him around, seeking to take his life. David knew what it was to seek the presence of God. He knew what it was to seek the direction of God. And I believe David has this confidence because he's done that and he's seen the faithfulness of God. That's why he can say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life because he defended my life every time Saul picked up a spear and chunked it at me. Every time he laid a trap and God raised up Jonathan, I didn't take my own plans and he raised up his own son to aid me along the way. The time that I ran to this place and that place and the Lord sustained me through different people. You know, when we see in that encounter with him and Saul, the one time that David does raise up his hand against Saul, what does David do? He repents. When David's hiding out in the cave and Saul comes in there, he goes and cuts part of his cloak off and then comes out and begins to brag and say, look, I could have taken your life. And immediately he realized he was wrong. He says, no, that's the world's way. That's not God's way. And so we see this confidence In God comes through seeking his presence and seeking his direction. In verse 13 and 14 is that bookend that kind of closes the door here and reiterates this declaration of confidence that David has. Look at what he says. I would have despaired. He said, if I had not sought the presence and the direction of God, I surely would have despaired. He said, I would have despaired unless I believed, unless I trusted, unless I had faith after seeking the presence and direction of God that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. David had not yet seen deliverance against the physical enemies that were encamped against him, but he had such confidence that he said, I will see deliverance. even though he didn't know for sure if he would. But that's the faith that he had. As he sought God's presence, he sought his face and sought God's direction. I would have despaired. I tell you what, if if you want to find yourself in a very dark spot in life, don't seek the face and direction of God. And you will end up digging a hole (laughs) in which... It is just darkness. There's no way out. You will be in a spot of despair because you will have realized that there is absolutely nothing that you can do to overcome that. That is only God. We look through Scripture. We can look through the narrative of Scripture and we can look at account after account after account, where God upheld the righteous when they sought after him. We look at it in the life of Daniel, don't we? Brothers sold him into slavery. God sustained him, didn't he? He continued to seek after him. He rose up, ends up back in jail, ends up back there, gets to save his whole family out of the midst of it. Joseph, not Daniel. I don't know why I said Daniel. Joseph. We we see God's faithfulness as he continues to seek after God. What does he say when his brothers finally show up? What you meant for my home, God meant for the deliverance of many. He would have taken matters up into his own hands. Hey, I'm going to fight and I'm going to claw. I'm going to get myself out. I'm going to escape. I'm going to break out of jail. I'm going to make it back home. Hey, I've made it out of jail. I'm second in control of everything. I could take a trip. 
Continue to seek the Lord. Continue. And so for us, if we look throughout Scripture and we see this, I would have despaired. Unless I had believed, I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the giving. And then right here, verse 14, I believe, it is some of the key. In the middle of, of seeking the presence of God and seeking the direction of God, I believe these are the instructions how we remain confident in that process as we continue to seek. And this isn't a one-time seeking. This is a continual. This is ongoing. We continue to seek the presence of God day by day. We continue to seek the direction of God day by day by day. And so until God moves, until God acts, when we're in that desperate situation, what do we do? We wait. So, well, the enemy's still right there, Ricky. Wait. Wait. What he says, wait for the Lord, be strong. And let your heart take courage. And it's again, it, it's the courage and in, in the being strong is not in David. It wasn't in us. It's not in us. The strength is in the Lord, right? Because we pursue his presence. We seek his presence. We seek his direction. We realize who God is. When we spend time seeking after the Lord and meditating on his word, are we not reminded who God is? Are we not reminded what it is that God is capable of? Are we not reminded how God delivered and God delivered and God delivered and God delivered? And so we wait and we trust. We remain strong in the Lord. And then he reiterates it again because I believe this is the toughest part. He says, yes. Hey, in case you didn't get it, yes. I said, wait for the Lord. I don't know about you, Guys, we're kind of wired this way. We're fixers, right? Something, something's wrong for our wife in a situation, and our response is, all right, I'll go fix that. Sometimes we make it a whole lot worse by trying to fix it. <laughs> I saw some elbows go in there. <laughs> but it's tough for us to wait especially when people are lying about us, especially when they're seeking to devour our flesh, when they're coming against us, when the world says, no, you, you, if they're big and bad, you better figure out a way to be bigger and badder. When I say, I don't have to because I serve the creator of the universe. I'm the one that knows what his word is when he looks out at the armies of the world and those armies that have risen up against God's people. I'm reminded of what God's word says that says when he looks at that, he laughs. <laughs> who, who are they against God? They're nobody. And are we going to have the confidence in God to wait for his timing and how he's going to act? You see it throughout Scripture. Wait on the Lord. The enemy's all around you. Guess what? I'm going to do something that, that you couldn't make up if you wanted to. Guess what? You're going out to battle with some jars and some torches. And all you're going to do is break them and yell and light some torches. And you're not going to raise up a sword. They're going to start fighting each other. Wait for the Lord. Yes. Wait for the Lord. And so in, in our response to this, verse 14, I believe, is the big part of the response. Yes, we need to have confidence. And we understand confidence comes by seeking the presence of God and seeking the direction of God. But once we get to that point where we say, you know what, I'm confident in who God is and what God can do. Now I got to wait. <laughs> wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take courage. Do you lack confidence right now in the situation that you're in? If you're in a desperate situation right now and you're lacking confidence, it's likely because you're trusting in the wrong things. You're seeking after the wrong things. Because your confidence is in the resources that you believe you physically have access to. <laughs> Instead of your confidence being in the Lord. So the questions become, if we're lacking confidence, who or what are we actually seeking after? 
Because I believe if we're seeking after the Lord, his presence and his direction, the confidence is going to come in the midst of that situation. If we're seeking after anything else, you're not going to be confident in that situation. The enemy's going to grow 10 feet every single day. You know that? David and Goliath. I'm sure by the time David showed up there, the Bible says how tall he was. They probably said he was 20 feet taller than he was. Every day they looked at him. Their, their seeking, their, their focus was on the enemy instead of the Lord. The enemy seemed to get bigger and bigger and bigger every day. The situation seemed to get worse and worse and worse every day. Whereas in reality, nothing changed about Goliath. Maybe nothing changes about your situation, but your focus is there and it seems to grow. Whereas your focus, your seeking comes back to the Lord. In the same way those enemies seem to get bigger and bigger, I think when we seek the Lord and we meditate on his word and we seek his presence and his direction, we begin to see how big God really is. When we don't, we tend to shrink God down and put him in a box and say, well, God can do this and God can't do that. But when we seek his presence and direction, so what are you seeking? Who are you seeking? What are you trusting in? And then for others here today, one of the big things that I see within this text, David had a physical enemy that was encamped around him seeking his physical life. You and I have a shared enemy in this world who's seeking to kill to steal and destroy. It is the devil. We, we face a real enemy. An enemy who came in in Genesis chapter 3 and tempted Adam and Eve. Surely God didn't say that. Surely God didn't mean that. Surely you understand that if you do this, you'll get to be like God. You'll get to be your own God. And they chose disobedience. They chose their direction instead of God's direction. Sin entered to the world. You and I are born with a nature bent towards sin. And given the first opportunity, we will choose it every single time. From a little bitty baby. No, don't go. Hey, you can walk now. Don't, don't get that remote. I'm gone. It's mine. But praise God. In the same way that David could stand there while the enemy was encamped around him and say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I can stand here today and say, you know what? I know that Ricky Fuchs has sinned. I know that sin brings about death and separation from God for all eternity. I know that scripture tells me there's nothing Ricky Fuchs can do about his sin to get rid of it. But I also know, and I can stand with confidence and say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. I don't have to fear my sin. I don't have to fear the price of my sin because I have trusted and confessed Jesus as my Lord. God says, hey, you have an enemy who's the devil who, who tempted and is, it brought sin. And even though Adam and Eve, again, Adam and Eve chose sin. They, they chose disobedience. But the enemy comes against us and leads us that way. We will choose sin, every single one of us. I don't care how, I care how good you think you are. <laughs> every single one of us are sinners. We sin. That separates us. But God, being rich in mercy, has made a way. Jesus Christ. Jesus came and he lived 
He lived the life that you and I couldn't live in complete obedience to the commands of God. Did everything seeking God's presence, doing everything God's way. Righteous, completely righteous. And then he went and died on the cross. Not because he was guilty, he went because I was guilty and because you're guilty and because you're guilty and because you're guilty and because you're guilty. And there he paid the price, appeasing the wrath of God and removing the guilt of our sin if we would repent and confess Jesus is Lord. And so maybe you're here this morning. Maybe that's you. You've never come to that point where you've turned away from your sin and placed your faith in Jesus. We want to give you the opportunity. Maybe you're here today and you say, Ricky, you know what? I don't know what to do with the situation that I'm facing. There's good news, you're in the right place today, and it's not because what anything Ricky said, it's because what the Word of God says. You can have confidence in God as you seek His presence and seek His direction. If the confidence isn't there, you're seeking after the wrong thing. You're trusting in the wrong thing. You're seeking to accomplish your plans instead of seeking God's direction. And you say, well, I I guess I blew it. (laughs) No. You stop right there. You repent. And you begin seeking the presence of God. And begin seeking the direction of God. And say, God, I'm not going to do it my way anymore. I'm going to seek after you. So as Fred and the others come and you stand, we're going to respond together this morning to this psalm. Maybe the response for you as a believer is, maybe you need to be at this altar Maybe there's a situation that is so big and you've been wrestling with it instead of wrestling with God. (laughs) Maybe you need to come and just lay that. You don't have to come up here to do it, but maybe you do. Maybe you want to come pray with someone. We'll be up here. Maybe you're here today and you're apart from God. You've never placed your faith in Jesus. I would love to talk with you and make sure that you know that you could have the same confidence that David had when David said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Father, today, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Psalm 27. I thank you for the fact that no matter how big an enemy looks to us, Father, you are always bigger. You are always stronger. Father, I pray. I pray for us. Father, I thank you that, Father, we do get to seek and come into your presence. I'm, uh, Father, David sought to be in your, your, your house, in your temple, in the, in the tent, in your presence with you, Lord. And Father, might we run to you each and every day, seeking your face, your presence, seeking your direction. Lord, I pray for the one that's here today that needs to come and unite with this church. Father, whatever it is we need to do to respond in this time, Father, I pray that we're obedient to your spirit.